February 23, 1791. Alexander and Eliza Hamilton write furiously in the flickering candlelight. Hours pass as they write, copy, and then write some more. Dawn slowly begins to creep across the eastern sky. With the all-night effort finally completed, Hamilton heads out to the most important meeting of his career, knowing the financial fate of the country rests on the manuscript they have just finished. Hamilton's off to meet with George Washington, but first, let's back up a bit and talk about the Bank of North America, founded by Robert Morris, which opened its doors in 1782. This was the first bank established in American history, incorporated by an act of the Pennsylvania legislature. But why did we need banks anyway? The purpose, as Alexander Hamilton put it, was so deposits of coin could act as a fund for circulating a credit upon it, which is to answer the purpose of money. People need money, and that's what banks do. Banks create money. And if you watched the previous episode, you know the continental currency America relied on at this time was collapsing. So there was a great need for a stable currency that would be accepted throughout the country and abroad. Morris and Hamilton intended the Bank of North America to be what we would call a central bank, meaning it would create the currency of the whole country. That currency, at this point, had to be backed by precious metals because most people just had no confidence in paper anymore. After suffering through a bout of hyperinflation like they did with the Continental, anyone would feel that way. The success of colonial paper money in the mid-1700s had mostly been forgotten by now. Creating money isn't all Morris had in mind for the Bank of North America. Among other things, the new bank would hold US government deposits and issue loans to the government. It would also give loans to individuals and businesses, something that central banks don't do today. In truth, Morris and Hamilton wouldn't even have understood the term central bank. And honestly, since there was only one bank in the country at this point, the term doesn't really apply. Hamilton called it a public bank because its purpose was to hold government deposits and to serve the public's need for money and credit. He thought that each state and the federal government should have one public bank each, and he didn't see much of a need for any other banks to exist. Imagine that. He wanted a banking sector that was tightly controlled by the government. I see his views as being pretty comparable in this respect at least, to someone like Elizabeth Warren's. Public utility is more truly the object of public banks than private profit. But the Bank of North America, located in Philadelphia, had serious enemies in the rural parts of Pennsylvania, and that threw a wrench into Hamilton's plans. They accused it of being an agent of foreign powers, like Britain, and also of being incompatible with democracy itself. That's kind of nuts, but I get it. No institution like it had ever existed before in American history. It's understandable that it faced some distrust. In 1787, the bank's enemies forced it to accept a much more restrictive charter that prevented it from acting in any capacity as a central bank. So that's where it exits the story. But side note, it actually stayed in operation until 1908. After the Bank of North America was chopped off at the knees, Hamilton didn't waste any time. He immediately started planning for a new bank to take its place. This time, he resolved that it would have a federal charter that would take it out of the hands of state legislatures. And after all, the bank would serve the entire country, right? The only problem was that now he had to convince Congress. This was a tough task because the federal government had never chartered a corporation before. Was that even constitutional? The Constitution said nothing about banking. Many people actually thought that its silence on the banking issue meant that this was a power reserved for the states under the 10th Amendment. Most delegates to the Constitutional Convention certainly saw it that way, but not Hamilton. Silence to him was a doorway, cracked ever so slightly open, that he would drive a Mack truck through. 
How's that for original intent? Even the founders disagreed on what the Constitution meant. To Hamilton, it didn't make any sense that we had done all this work to fight a revolution and establish a new system of government, only to wind up with a feeble institution that couldn't even carry out the small responsibilities the states had given to it. As the first Secretary of the Treasury, he had to borrow money from the Bank of North America and the Bank of New York, which he had personally set up in 1784, just to pay his own salary and the salaries of the President and Congress. It was an absurd situation. Hamilton argued that despite the Tenth Amendment, despite the intentions of the other framers, the federal government had the implied powers to do whatever it took to carry out the duties it had in the Constitution. And he's got a point. How could the Constitution give responsibilities, but not the power to actually do those things? As sensible as that is, James Madison disagreed. Speaking before Congress about the bill to create Hamilton's bank, he said, The power exercised by this bill is condemned by the silence of the Constitution, is condemned by the rule of interpretation arising out of the Constitution, and I hope it will receive its final condemnation by the vote of this House. James Jackson from Georgia also opposed it, as did others from agrarian states. If we establish a precedent now before us, there is no saying where it shall stop. This is calculated to benefit a small part of the United States, the mercantile interest only. Shall we build an altar to the old paper money of the revolution, which ruined individuals but saved the republic, and burn on that all the bank charters present and future, and their notes with them? For these are to ruin both republic and individuals. Uh, wait a second. Don't farmers need money too? This was before the California gold rush. This was before the silver discoveries out west. There wasn't enough gold and silver coins to go around at this time. So what were Madison and Jefferson thinking people would use to buy things, if not banknotes? Why are the agrarian states so opposed to a national bank? Well, farmers at this time mostly used barter to trade with each other, and that practice continued into the 19th century. Local merchants would also offer book credit when money was scarce. They would keep track of what different people owed them in their logs. It was a simpler time. This basic form of credit worked for them. Why they need banknotes? Of course, this was before farming became the capital-intensive business it is now. Most farming in this period was done for subsistence by individual farmers and their families, not on large slave plantations although those did exist. This was before the mechanical reaper and before the steel plow. Farming wasn't efficient in those days, but it didn't take a lot of capital either. So farmers at this time didn't really have a need for bank loans. They barely even needed currency at all. Capitalism was still off in the distance at this point, coming on like a freight drain, but it hadn't completely hit America yet. Banks and bank loans were important for merchants, but not so much farmers. Hamilton was eventually able to get his plan through Congress. It passed the House by a vote of 39 to 20. I wasn't in the room where it happened, so I don't know how he managed to do that. But his job wasn't done. They don't tell you this in the musical, but Washington was sitting there with his veto pen ready. Jefferson, Washington's Secretary of State, and Edmund Randolph, his attorney general, both thought that chartering a bank was unconstitutional. And Washington was very aware that everything he did set a precedent for future administrations. So he definitely didn't want to do anything unconstitutional. Washington gave Hamilton a week to make his case for the constitutionality of a national bank, or he was going to veto it. And now we're back at that famous all-nighter. Pressure was on for Hamilton to write a compelling argument. Washington believed in the federal government, but he needed constitutional cover to sign the bill into law. So, Hamilton, what'd you come up with? The power which can create the supreme law of the land in any case is doubtless sovereign as to such case. 
This general and indisputable question puts at once an end to the abstract question whether the United States have power to erect a corporation. According to Hamilton, the federal government has powers not directly stated in the Constitution. They were implied from that founding document's sovereign nature. For example, the Constitution says the federal government has the power to raise an army. That has got to include the ability to raise the money needed to fund it, or the power was meaningless. Remember, as Treasury Secretary, Hamilton was having to borrow money right now just to pay the president's salary. He was just so over it. On the morning after Hamilton's all-nighter, a letter to the editor was printed on the front page of the Gazette of the United States, signed only a constitutionalist. I wonder who wrote it. It has been questioned by some whether the act of Congress for establishing the Bank of the United States is constitutional. But if it is a useful mean for carrying into effect any of the powers specifically vested in the government of the United States, and does not infringe the rights of any individual state or persons, on what principle can it be unconstitutional? Years later, Eliza Hamilton recalled her all-nighter and her and her husband's contributions to the founding of our nation. He made your government. He made your bank. I sat up all night with him to help him do it. I copied out his writing, and he carried it to President Washington, and we had a bank. On February 25, 1791, two days after reading Hamilton's opinion, Washington signed the bank bill into law. This decision may have fractured the nation into political parties and helped lead to Hamilton's death, but it put our young country on a solid financial footing going into the 19th century. This would not have been the case if Jefferson got his way. America would have ended up as a weak, agrarian nation had the Union even survived. Jefferson looked backwards, whereas Hamilton optimistically looked into the future, and his vision was embraced instead of Jefferson's. But even Hamilton couldn't foresee the immense changes about to take place in textile manufacture, the invention of the telegraph, and most importantly, the railroad. The growth of industry and the arrival of capitalism on the North American continent would change our country forever. 